This video is brought to you by Bright Sellers. What's up guys, Michael here, and today I'm gonna post up in the philosophy section of the South Park Library and see what sort of wisdom and truths our buds Matt and Trey have for us in the show's 25th season. Now, South Park's been critiquing various elements of American politics and culture since I was in middle school. In fact, the best gift I got for my 14th birthday was the original motion picture soundtrack to South Park, Bigger, Longer, Uncut. Yeah, and I'm yesterday. <laughs> Coincidentally, that was also the first movie I ever got caught sneaking into. Oops. But this season, the show's skepticism seems more focused. The first few episodes all explore aspects of our culture that can best be understood through the lens of an ideology called neoliberalism. The show's cultural jabs all point to the way that this political and economic ideology takes things like public controversy, social movements, and economic opportunities and renders them meaningless in the name of profit. So what happens when we analyze some cartoon kids who haven't aged in a quarter century alongside some philosophers who are super duper dead? Let's find out in this Philosopher Reacts to South Park Season 25 so far. And spoilers ahead for the first three episodes of Season 25 of South Park. But before we get into it, I want to tell you about this video sponsor, Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars is a subscription wine service that helps you discover new wines that you'll definitely love. And because they curate exclusive brands, plus wines from small vineyards from all over the world, chances are they'll introduce you to wines you otherwise never would have had an opportunity to try. Now, the process starts with a seven question quiz, which feeds into a sophisticated algorithm to figure out your taste profile. For instance, I told Bright Sellers that I like coffee, I'm not really into sweets, and I generally prefer reds. And so in my first box, they sent me wines like this Merlot, which has notes of vanilla, a little bit of a oak and plum flavor to it, and as you can see, a very cool label, um, and this, Garutsaminer, which is a white that I never would have tried before, but I really like. Now, I'm a bit of a wine guy myself, but there's still a lot I don't know. And Bright Cellar's emphasis on wine education can help me keep learning. Now, every bottle comes with its own wine education card, which includes tasting notes, recommended pairings, and other fun facts. Bright Cellars is the most convenient way to try new wines since they're delivered right to your door. And it's also a sustainable practice. The packaging is recyclable and plastic free. Plus, your monthly bottles may include biodynamic and sustainable varietals. Also, Bright Cellars has some cool new offerings this month, including low alcohol varietals and sparkling wines so you can snag the perfect bottle for any occasion. Get 50% off your first six bottle box at brightsellers.com slash wisecrack4. That's brightsellers.com slash wisecrack and the number four for a total of only $55, including shipping. Bright Cellars is the monthly wine club that matches you with the wine you'll love. Get started by taking the taste palette quiz to see your personalized matches. And now back to the show. Let's start with the first episode of the season, in which the kids, understandably, just really want to wear pajamas to school. But this being South Park in 2022, Matt and Trey also found some time to rag on celebrity love for decentralized currency. Let's check out our first clip. Bruh, we can have some goddamn bobs. What does Matt Damon say on that Bitcoin commercial? Fortune favors the brave. My dad said he listened to Matt Damon and lost all his money. Yes, everyone did! Okay, so it's worth quickly noting the continuity between this nod to celebrity crypto endorsements and the NFT plotline in the South Park post-COVID special, which we previously covered. It's a nice hint of things to come, as it's clear that for Matt and Trey, the hype around crypto simply represents one facet of the utter emptiness at the heart of our culture. And okay, until a crypto bro comes knocking at my door with an exciting spiritual opportunity, crypto isn't technically a religion. But it, it does make me think of Marx's infamous assertion that religion is the opiate of the masses. This line is up there with Nietzsche's God is dead in the hall of fame of philosophical statements that are oft quoted and rarely understood. And that's because people, um, they always ignore the words that immediately precede uh, Marx's assertion that religion is the name of a new pill produced by the Sackler family because the Sacklers are bad people that, that make opiates that are ruining our country. Those words are, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. Meaning that Marx isn't some religion-hating edgelord. Instead, he's pointing out that when people's lives and social conditions suck ass, they look for meaning and purpose somewhere else. And this is a theme throughout these episodes. 
folks trying to find meaning and purpose in their otherwise meaningless lives, except they don't do it through religion. They, they do it in much dumber ways. Hey guys, I just want to say I'm really proud to be a part of this office. Wearing our pajamas shows that we care about those school kids, that we care about other people. South Park Realtors! South, South Park, Park Realtors! Okay, so this idea that wearing pajamas shows that you, you care about kids, or more generally, um, that wearing or purchasing a certain product signifies you showing solidarity with a marginalized group is an empty gesture at best. And it shows how our soulless condition is no longer centered around religion, but some mix of marketing and capitalism. Maybe it used to be important to define yourself via a religious affiliation, i.e., as a good Catholic, I would never have premarital sex during Lent or on Christmas. But these days, it's more about defining ourselves via our consumer habits, i.e. I, I wear pajamas to stand with the children, or I eat at IHOP because they only serve pajama people. I'm sorry, sir, but we aren't seating anyone who isn't wearing their pajamas. And this transition from religion to capitalism, or more accurately, capitalism becoming the dominant system of belief, has turned lots of social and political issues into matters of consumption. As Walter Benjamin wrote in the aptly titled Capitalism as Religion, a religion may be discerned in capitalism. That is to say, capitalism serves essentially to allay the same anxieties, torments, and disturbances to which the so-called religions offered answers. Since the legalization of marijuana, communities of color, black and brown Coloradans, those most affected by the racist war on drugs, have now been locked out of the wealth creation of the industry. <laughs> Luckily, the public is starting to understand this unfairness, and many people are now talking of boycotting cannabis growers who are only white-owned. Boycotting away, what? We are seeing a healthy and dramatic spike in consumers who demand that their marijuana be grown by those who understand the fight for social equity. Ha uh ha -huh. ha. The bottom line is this. A completely white-owned weed business these days just isn't going to survive. <laughs> Wow, what's he gonna do? Um, okay, let's get back to that, that fun word we talked about before, neoliberalism. Now, it's a slippery term to define, only because it's a bit like explaining water to a fish, except, except we're the fish, and neoliberalism is basically everything else. Um, it's a political and economic ideology that slowly wrapped its tentacles around everything in our cultural life. Academic David Harvey uh, describes it like this. Neoliberalism is in the first instance a theory of political and economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. Basically, neoliberals argue that we are most likely to flourish under free market economic conditions with limited state control, an unrestrained market, and strong individual rights, which, I don't know, maybe, maybe doesn't sound so bad. But Harvey also argues that neoliberalism is a class project, which is carried out by and serves the interest of a corporate capitalist class. Even notably rich Catholic daddy Pope Francis has referred to what he calls the dogma of neoliberal faith to describe the system. It, it's almost like it's a system that people can put their faith into due to the promise of a better life, but at its core, it's just serving a small cadre of bros. Kind of like cryptocurrency? And you might be thinking, but sir, I am no neoliberal. I completely get how this is a system that serves the interests of one tiny group at the expense of the rest of us. How dare you lump me in with it? But according to many scholars, um, that's the wild thing about neoliberalism. Its brilliance is its ability to affect everything in our culture, not just economic and political systems. In his book, Neoliberalism's Demons, Adam Kotzko argues that neoliberalism has become a complete way of life with a holistic worldview. He even goes so far as to look at neoliberalism as a political theology, again, following Marx and Benjamin's lead. And this holistic worldview has penetrated the town of South Park. This character is explaining that the very real plight of marginalized communities under the war on drugs is being addressed not through, say, widespread exonerations or by broadening economic and social support systems for folks who went to jail for doing or selling weed. 
Instead, the racism inherent in America's drug policies and weed industry can be solved by spending your money at the right businesses and boycotting the wrong ones. It's neoliberalism to a T. And of course, we go on to see Randy try to turn these systemic injustices into a clever marketing opportunity for his own weed brand. Actions speak louder than words, gang. I guess, I guess I just want you to think about it. Wow, dad got woke. This right here makes me think of one of my favorite lines from Soren Kierkegaard. Um, and this comes from a short essay called The Present Age. And he says this, he says, a revolutionary age is an age of action. Ours is the age of advertisement and publicity. It works as a description of the social effects of neoliberalism, in which the economic system can absorb all types of calls for change in various social movements without actually changing the system that creates those problems. I.e., neoliberalism will both poison you and sell you the antidote. And this is very much what Randy is up to here, in which his response to the systemic racism at the heart of the weed industry is to get a picture with Tolkien's dad and throw it up on a billboard. And, and this isn't South Park saying anything extreme. Our current president once argued that seeing interracial couples in commercials for major brands was evidence that our country was less racist, rather than, you know, simply proof that marketing to interracial couples is an economically promising prospect for big corporations. For Kierkegaard, this comes down to the distinction between action and, and reflection, or doing the right things and thinking the right things. This emphasis on belief over action uh, complements Marx and Benjamin's ideas about capitalism becoming a type of religion, in which believing the right things is more important than changing the world in any significant way. It's the difference between action and advertising. Randy isn't reflecting on inequality in the weed industry to think critically about his complicity in the system and what actions could change it. He just wants to feel good by publicly agreeing with the right ideas. Like pajama-wearing real estate agents performing solidarity with the kids, Randy's performing anti-racism for his own economic interests. Okay, um, so let's check this out. Stan went to the doctor um, because he had symptoms of racism and he wants to see if the doctor can fix him. You really thought a couple of black people had a child and named him Token? Why would anyone name a black kid Token? You're a piece of No, I was just trying- You were just going along with the dominant culture of the white paradigm. That's what you were just- Get out of my office, you make me sick! I'm sorry! I don't know what's wrong with some people. I wonder if anyone else thought that this kid's name was Token. Huh? Anybody? Anyone else just assume his name was Token? Because that's disgusting, and you are the problem. Doctor? He means, he I means thought us. I told you to get out of my office because you seriously make me sick. I'm gonna sh my pants right now. Doctor, please, I don't wanna be like this. I'll do anything, just tell me what to do. Well, you wanna change? Then I suggest you start doing a lot of reading. Wow, the cure for racism is reading. Um, struggling to grapple with the history of racism and your complicity in that history. Read books because this way you can both get access to the right ideas while also buying more stuff on amazon.com. Thanks, Jeffrey Bezos. Now think back to that Kierkegaard quote I just mentioned, where rather than passion and action, an age of reflection boils down to advertising and publicity, where critical thought and social justice become marketing campaigns, where Burger King reminds us that black lives matter. In the same essay, Kierkegaard says, an age without passion has no values and everything is transformed into representational ideas. There are certain remarks and expressions which though true and reasonable up to a point are lifeless. When a society has no real values, even statements and ideas that are true and valid end up becoming pretty empty. That about sums up this season's thesis statement so far. And while Kierkegaard predates the neoliberal revolution, this is what many argue neoliberalism does. It takes statements and ideas that, that could be true, sucks out their political force, turns them into easily marketed slogans, and sells them back to us as a product. Real values are replaced by toothless cultural signifiers. One of our fourth grade students says he's done a lot of work and has grown as a person, and he'd like to share his journey with you. Please welcome Stan Marsh. Sup guys, you know, I've done a lot of reading lately, and I'd like to announce that the school has allowed me to declare today J.R.R. Tolkien Appreciation Day. Look at his little poser with his little poser glasses. 
Okay, um, now to be clear, reading books is good. We love books. Philosophers especially love books. But there's reason to be skeptical of Stan's journey beyond his obnoxious pair of, of poser spectacles. Now, Nietzsche said that the oversaturation of an age with history seems to be hostile and dangerous to life because it can lead an age into a dangerous mood of irony in regard to itself and subsequently into the even more dangerous mood of cynicism, a mood through which the forces of life are paralyzed and at last destroyed. Now here, it seems like the show is, is arguing for something similar. Now, it's pretty ironic when neoliberalism turns movements about fundamentally changing the world into excuses to buy books, listen to podcasts, or wear cool t-shirts. And this turns from irony into cynicism when people slowly start to view everything as just another marketing ploy and just stop giving a shit altogether. In reading The Lord of the Rings to understand his friend, Tolkien, Stan just ends up making things about himself and hasn't done anything to make Tolkien's life any better. He's performing a new type of social identity. Creating a Tolkien holiday at the school is a cynical ploy. It stands way of performing allyship without actually changing anything fundamental about their school, town, or world. Okay, so enough with um, symbolic pajamas and, you know, weed companies doing marketing and books. Let's get to an industry with integrity, purpose, and passion, real estate. Um, so this is episode three. Let's cut over here. There's a real estate craze taking over South Park, and Cartman wants to cash in. Ever heard of a real estate agent, Butters? Well, not really. Yeah, well, neither had I. So I looked it up on a bunch of those shows and stuff. You don't do anything. You just look nice and hug people, and then when someone buys or sells a house, you make money. Wow, well, that sounds like a good deal. It's more than a good deal, Butters. It's f***ing legal theft. Okay, um, we're not doing a, a real estate agent reacts or anything here, but... It's worth noting that under neoliberalism, rates of home ownership have plummeted, and housing has turned into a commodity with exponentially rising values. Values that sometimes seem disconnected from the reality of housing as a thing that humans need. Um, in the past year or so, there have been multiple stories about how more and more single family homes are being purchased by Wall Street investment firms or Silicon Valley investors. Um, these groups grabbed 15% of available homes in the first quarter of 2021. And that's not counting all the homes purchased to be turned into Airbnbs and other short term rental investments. Carvin sees that something about the system smells like bull, but more than bull, he smells an opportunity to exploit the bull for cash. I can almost hear the crowds chanting USA, USA right now. Because creating an industry around what should be a human right and then making wild profits off speculating on that thing is very much in neoliberalism's Q zone. It doesn't work that way, Eric. You aren't going to make any money. You're just driving up the market and none of your deals will make it through escrow. Well, we'll just see in 30 days, won't we? Except for some of my deals which have a 45 day contingency period. Oh, okay, that can't be real because all the real estate shows on TV tell me that um, you make lots of money and it's super easy. Um, real estate agents, hit us in the comments and let us know. Now, Cartman is operating under the conditions of neoliberal reality. The one that sells us on the idea that home ownership is the most important thing we can do with our money. The one that pumps out more real estate reality shows than we have time to watch. And the one that tries to convince us that a housing crisis caused by unaffordable housing can be solved by, by building more housing for real estate agents to sell and for Wall Street firms to buy. Now, Carbon's mom is aware that much of the system is just a house of cards waiting to fall down, but she's still complicit within it. And we can understand this via French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, who is very familiar with folks like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Marx that we've discussed so far. He's also the Obi-Wan Kenobi to Slavoj Zizek's Luke Skywalker. Now, Lacan drew a distinction between reality, which is the product of all the symbols and structures that make up our social world, and the real, which is all the messy stuff that exists on the other side of those symbols and structures and is in constant tension with reality. In other words, the real is what any reality has to suppress, and reality is constituted via this act of repression. It's a mind of a concept, and Lacan himself changed its meaning throughout his life, but the point here is that neoliberalism, a system pretty accurately represented in these episodes, creates a reality that tries to cover up the real. And in this season, at least so far, 
Trey and Matt are pushing some of the holy grails of neoliberalism to the point where we can see the absurdity of this reality. And while the show isn't offering any magical solutions to the neoliberal condition, David Harvey has said that resistance to neoliberalism can occur in a number of different ways. In my work, I stress that the point at which value is realized is also a point of tension. Value is produced in the labor process, and this is a very important aspect of class struggle. But value is realized in the market through sale, and there's a lot of politics to that. A lot of resistance to capital accumulation occurs not only on the point of production, but also through consumption and the realization of value. So basically, one way of resistance is at the point at which we make stuff i.e. work. But there is also an opportunity for resistance and consumption, meaning that we have the ability to call bullshit on some of the products and ideas that neoliberalism sells to us as valuable and important. Okay, guys, I, I know I threw kind of a lot at you today, but what else do you expect when they set me loose on 60 minutes of adult animation with a stack of books and a fresh bag of coffee beans? And if this all seems complicated, it's because neoliberalism is incredibly complex and requires all the tools of philosophy, theology, economics, and even psychoanalysis to really understand the system and what the system is doing to us. And because Matt and Trey are cranky Gen X libertarians and not a couple of wine-soaked French Marxists, they offer no underlying message for how the world should be in these episodes. And that's okay, because these episodes still make it possible to look at some philosophical ideas that run right through the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. And if you want to dig deeper, I will leave you a reading list in the description, so check those out. Now, thanks again for hanging out with us, and please jump in the comments and let us know what you think about the ideas being explored in this season of South Park. A huge thanks as always to our patrons for supporting our channel, and be sure to check out Wisecrack's podcast as well. Hit that subscribe button like you're ringing a massive bell that lets the world know that you think all the right things. And don't forget to ring that actual bell either. Uh, as always, let us know if there's any other content that you think warrants a philosophical once over. As always, thanks for watching. Later. I would never have premarital sex during Lent or uh, or or on Christmas because because it's just a, it's just a hot day. You're under the mistletoe. You, you've had a few eggs, dogs. Mom and dad are asleep. You go, you know. It's 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 a good day for that.